Well, well, let's set the scene a little bit. I mean, most of our viewers know there is the most right-wing or religiously extreme coalition in power in Israel with members of the Otzma Yehudit or Jewish Power Party who are acolytes of the fanatical hate preacher Meyer, Meyer, Rabbi Meir Kahane, uh, the late hate preacher Meir Kahane, in Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition. So Netanyahu was previously seen as kind of an extreme figure, is actually the moderate in this coalition holding things together. And these are figures who want to invade the Al-Aqsa compound and usher in a third Jewish temple in order to bring about the messianic redemption of the land of Israel. Uh, these are some of the most dangerous and fanatical figures that have ever been in an Israeli governing coalition, um, which in some ways lifts the mask on what Zionism has always been. But we'll get into that. Let's just set the scene with what happened on April 4th and April 5th at the Al -Aqsa, inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque when Israeli security forces violated the status quo. I'll explain the status quo in a second, but let's just see some video of what took place. I mean, these are Israeli forces, Palestinian worshipers with rifle butts on the night of April 4th, on Tuesday night. And they are trying to force them out. Here's a uh, Israeli forces beating Palestinian men as they attempted to leave the mosque. It's sort of like a ritual beating. These are the those are the Magav, the border police, uh, who patrol East Jerusalem, the occupied East Jerusalem in the old city. And you can see here that um, this is Isa Amro from Hebron. I'm noting that the Israeli police used numbers to identify the detained worshipers from the Al-Aqsa Mosque, those they arrested that night. And then the, the following day, this is probably April 5th. Yeah, this is April 5th. Uh, where'd they get that idea for numbers from? Uh, previously during the second Intifada, Israeli occupation forces had written numbers on the arms of men it arrested in occupied cities. And this became a big scandal in Israel because, of course, Jews were had numbers tattooed on their arms in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, but we can see this practice returning. So it's kind of like never again, but conditions apply. Um, what was going on there? What was taking place? Well, this, st this started um, mid on midnight, so late Tuesday night. Let's step back actually a little bit. It's Passover. Um, we just celebrated, my family just celebrated Passover. And it's also Ramadan. It's the Ramadan season. And the weather is heating up in Israel, Palestine. It's protest season. It's the season when fighting and wars and clashes usually take place. Uh, Ramadan is a very emotional time. People grow closer to their community. Uh, and if your community is surrounded by troops, then you may actually be blockaded in for Passover. And the Passover holiday, as celebrated by fundamentalist elements, in Israel is extremely ethnocentric. In each generation, a new foe has risen up to destroy us. Uh, it culminates with the killing of the Gentile firstborn. And I have seen this explicitly invoked by state-backed Israeli uh, religious nationalist rabbis to justify the killing of Palestinians. Some would say it's a perversion of Judaism, but that's their ethnocentric or ethno-fascist interpretation. So everyone was predicting violence. And everyone was predicting that the violence would take place around the Al-Aqsa compound, which for these fundamentalists is the site of the future third Jewish temple. So Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Israeli forces came in to Al-Aqsa Mosque. They broke in and they were trying to remove Palestinian worshipers who had stayed after evening prayers um, for um, itikaf, which is, you know, night prayers but it's also a form of resistance because they knew that these fanatical settlers were going to raid the compound the following day and conduct Jewish prayer in violation of the status quo. The status quo means the um, regime that had been put into place to keep the peace 
around the old city after 1967, where the Islamic Waqf, which is uh, maintained by Jordan, oversees the Al-Aqsa compound, and then Israel and its security forces get to control the Western Wall, where Jewish worship takes place. But these fanatical settlers, they don't want to just worship at the Western Wall, and they don't actually believe in Jewish prayer per se. Their idea of sanctifying God is through the mass sacrifice of goats and sheep. And what they've been seeking to do is smuggle sheep into the Al-Aqsa compound. They've even offered $5,000 bounties to take sheep into the Al-Aqsa compound or goats and sacrifice them. And so you have this taking place. Then the Israeli forces come in to forcibly remove Palestinian worshipers who are staying there overnight and also trying to prevent it. It leads to these scenes of beating. And the provocation has led to a response in the form of rockets from Lebanon first, which is the first time we've seen rockets actually target the northern colonies of Israel. Here's a look at those rockets. And they did serious damage. I mean, the Iron Dome didn't work here. This is the Iron Dome that we're subsidizing, by the way, as U.S. taxpayers. So this is serious. It's serious when rockets come in from Lebanon for the first time since 2006. And most of you watching will remember that 2006 was the time that Israel suffered a bloody nose. It was effectively beaten out of southern Lebanon by Hezbollah, the main resistance faction in the Shia resistance faction uh, based in, in Beirut and southern Lebanon. So what Hezbollah is sending the message here, if you respond, we will respond even more strongly and you do not want that because we can hit Haifa, we can hit your northern cities and blanket them in rockets, katushas, and maybe more. All of this happened because of the settler fanatics. Remember, 2014, settler fanatics triggered the devastating war between Israel and the factions of the Gaza Strip after they kidnapped and murdered a 15-year-old boy in occupi occupied East Jerusalem, Mohammed Abu Qadir pouring gasoline down his throat and setting him on fire. Then 2021, same thing. Settler fanatics attempting to take over Palestinian homes in the occupied East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah triggered a response from the factions in the Gaza Strip who took it upon themselves to protect those families in East Jerusalem and declare that we are not separate here in the Gaza Strip. There were also incursions into the Temple Mount. And then we have this current situation where this extreme government is in power, but it's not just an extreme government. It's fanatics like Itamar Ben-Gavir, who are actually in charge of Israeli police, Israeli security factions, and who are followers of this temple movement, which seeks to destroy the Al-Aqsa compound and replace it with a third Jewish temple. And back in January... Itamar Ben-Gavir, ben if you don't know who he is, he was like the lawyer for the most fanatical violent settlers for years and has risen to power through this coalition. He actually went to the Al-Aqsa compound in a flagrant provocation aimed at provoking violence. Hamas called this uh, a potential detonator of violence in the region. And you can see who's around Itamar Ben-Gavir right now. This guy is the security minister in charge of his own private army. He's surrounded by the Israeli police as he enters the third holiest site in Islam. Now, there's another. And Max, this is, Max, this is basically like the playbook, right? They do this every yeah. time or whenever they want to uh, trigger uh, a round of violence. I mean, um, Ariel Sharon did the same thing back in, in 2000. 2000, right? Um, okay, so, so Sharon like, brought They must have this in some playbook that they just dust off every time they want to have, or have, or have an excuse to bomb Gaza and yeah. raid the occupied West Bank. Yeah, Sharon uh, triggered the Second Intifada deliberately because he knew that it would advance his own uh, plans, which he eventually 
got through through the Gaza disengagement. Back in 2000, he, he ascended to the Al-Aqsa compound, caused violence in the old city that spun completely out of control. Israel then fired a million bullets against Palestinians in the month of October 2000 as part of their push strategy to cause Palestinian violence. There had been no suicide bombings by that point. Yeah. And then the bombings followed. Yes. So, but Sharon, however, was secular. This is, this is a religious figure who has called this month for riots and invasions of the Al-Aqsa compound and who is linked to a movement that began, well, it began many, many decades ago, gained strength through the 1967 occupation of the West Bank where these and East Jerusalem, where these holy sites were opened. Uh, but in the 1980s, you saw a mentor of Itamar Ben-Gvir, Yisrael Ariel, start the Jewish underground to actually bomb the Al-Aqsa compound, to blow it up, um, to give way to the third Jewish temple. In 1996, the Yesha Council of Settler Rabbis issued uh, their version of a fatwa, basically declaring that the Orthodox Jewish understanding of the Al-Aqsa compound, which is that Jewish prayer is forbidden unless Jews are first purified by water mixed with the ashes of a red heifer is null and void and that Jews should just go up there and start praying. Um, it was at that same time that one of these figures from the Yesha Council, Dove Lior, declared then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin a Din Rodef or a pursuer of Jews. And when you're declared a Din Rodef, a uh, Jewish fundamentalist has an obligation to kill you. And so one of Lior's followers killed Rabin. Why? Because the Oslo Accords were seen as an obstruction to the seizure of the entire land of Israel, which would have provided the basis for messianic redemption. So Rabin had to be killed. So then we moved to 2000, as you pointed out, Aaron, Ariel Sharon going there, triggering violence. And then we moved to the present day as this temple movement gained strength with Israeli state support and one of its key figures gaining control of the police and through a deal recently cut with Netanyahu, his own private militia of 2,000 hooligans in police uniform. So wait, so Itamar Ben-Gavir, this fanatic, gets his own, how does that work? He gets his own private militia, like to do what? To crack down on protests inside Israel, to attack Palestinian citizens of Israel. Basically, the deal was cut because Ben-Gavir had first convinced Netanyahu to carry out judicial reforms, which would have given the settlers more power and supposedly democratized the judiciary, which led to these massive protests that we've been seeing in Israel against Netanyahu among the liberal population that believes in the Supreme Court. And so that's putting a lot of pressure on Netanyahu. So first to relieve the pressure from his right, Netanyahu says, we're going to suspend the judicial reforms and I will give you, Ben Gavir, and your people, your own private militia, if you just stop pushing uh, on the courts. Right. And then to relieve the pressure from his left, Netanyahu has the opportunity to send the police in to beat the hell out of Palestinian worshipers, knowing that it will trigger violence. And that violence, the rockets, the news cycle, it will overwhelm the protests and people will start to kind of more come together as a society because now the Negev or Nakab region in Israel's south is under rocket fire from Gaza and the northern colonies have been hit with rockets too. Um, you know, people are going into bomb shelters. It's the perfect situation for Netanyahu. But the, cla the, the, the most clownish, fanatical figures are in charge of Israel's security forces, and they, in many ways, hold the reins and are deciding where things are going. And then you have Hezbollah deciding, you're afraid of us. You will not strike us back in any meaningful way unless you want to trigger a regional war. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're going to demonstrate deterrence. And they did so. What was Israel's response in Lebanon? They hit some open spaces, like some... Uh, farms they didn't want to get uh get things going with hezbollah so, so, so that's interesting so israel will obviously keep bombing gaza because gaza is relatively defenseless it's an open-air prison but you're saying that in lebanon israel does not want that fight right now well even in gaza it's important to note that Israel did the same thing, which they often do where they bomb what they call Hamas training sites which are open fields and these training sites 
frequently change. They didn't want to escalate with the factions in Gaza because we saw in 2021, those factions were able to actually arrange rocket set pieces over Tel Aviv to actually strike targets more accurately and more far away from Gaza than they ever had before and cause serious disruptions and destabilization inside Israeli society. So Netanyahu is trying, along with his security chiefs, are trying to prevent things from falling apart uh, in, 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 as far as the security situation is concerned. And, but he's, the, the politics of Israel have been destabilized internally. So Netanyahu is besieged on all sides. He uh, recently dismissed his defense chief, which led to or intensified all of these military reservists, particularly those in light, aligned with the liberal or centrist secular factions of the Ashkenazi elite in, in Israel. You know, the people you see out protesting in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, military reservists refusing to perform duties. Who are these military reservists? Uh, they're led by Air Force officers. The Air Force officers are like the cream of the crop of Israeli society. They're the most educated. Uh, they tend to be, you know, white and tend to come from the liberal parts of society. And they're also the ones who carry out the bombings of Gaza that leave entire families massacred. And they refuse to perform duty. Why? Because they oppose this far right government and the attack by Netanyahu on his own security chiefs because they won't go along with the legal reforms. So you can see how complicated this is getting yeah. uh, for Netanyahu and how unstable it is. Um, but then, you know, you have so much of the population supporting people like Itamar Ben-Gavir, turning away not only from the kind of status quo that's prevailed legally or politically, but from the Orthodox Jewish status quo to a pure ethno-fascism, a pure Jewish supremacism, because what they have grown up in is nothing yeah. but military service, years and years of conflict and propaganda against Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims in general. So it's a tinderbox right now. It could go anywhere, but Netanyahu, I mean, it's just so ironic to say it, but Netanyahu is the one who's trying to prevent an escalation. I think and Israel's meanwhile, totally lost control. I don't know if you saw this, Max, but recently um, the they had like they had this envoy, this global envoy to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, yeah. yeah, and she recently was forced to step down because I think she mildly criticized the judicial reforms or something. Yeah, yeah. And she's she's a person who goes around calling everyone anti-Semitic if they dare to criticize Israel. Right. And even she was forced out because I think she mildly or she voiced some sort of tepid support for the protest or something. Yeah, her name is Noah Tishby, yeah. and she's sort of like an actress and. Uh, a uh, model who was put up there to denounce everyone as an anti-Semite because she's essentially <laughs> telegenic and, you know, they needed her to do that job to just in the, this, this fake job of di labeling every criticism of Israel, a form of anti-Semitism. And here's a good reply to Noah Tishby resigning from Rachel Roberts, who is a anti-Zionist Jewish activist here, here's Noah Tishby's uh, resignation. It's with disappointment and sadness that I can confirm that the current Israeli government has dismissed me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, you know, at some point you'll realize that no matter how much I make up, how high you hike your skirt or how much you flirt with talk show hosts, the cause you work for is unjust and the people you work for are racist scum. I don't know if Noah Tishby will realize that just like I don't believe that the protesters in Israel in Israel proper will realize that what they are protesting for is just another more enlightened form of racist eth ethnocentric Zionism. Um, they just essentially want the mask put back on their system. Uh, they're not protesting against the brutalization of Palestinians at Al-Aqsa. They just don't want these fanatical clowns running their country. And here's a really illustrative video of Israeli protesters uh, begging APAC to save them from Netanyahu. Everybody out there, right? heading for dark times. APAC, we need you. We need you with us. 
In fact, you've supported Israel through all our wars. This is a war for Israel's future. We are in a critical moment now. It's about time that Howard Kaur will raise his voice, not just behind the screen, because we're on the edge. <laughs> wow. We ask of the representatives from APAC here today to tell our Prime Minister that they believe Israel should stay a strong democracy as it is today. You cannot be quiet. <laughs> so dramatic. Please, please help us. What do they want APAC to do? Let's do it together. What the hell? Oh, the handmaiden's tale. That's like the thing that liberals do under Trump. They do the handmaiden's tale. Well, they want APAC to speak up uh -huh. uh, against Netanyahu and all of the anti-democratic measures. But a what is APAC? But, you know, the apartheid lobby that supports every brutal war yeah. provides the, the perfect. I mean, it, without APAC, there would be no funding for the occupation. APAC is the oil that greases the wheels of the occupation and apartheid machine. And so that shows you the contradictions of these liberal Zionist protests, which preceded all of this violence. And I think inflamed it in a lot of ways because Netanyahu needed something to get him out of that. Mm. I mean, he was getting criticized lightly even by the Biden administration there are some rumors that this was sort of a Biden color revolution to get Netanyahu out. I didn't really see enough evidence to support that. Um, and Max, let me ask you, what's up with yeah. the Palestinian Authority? They're still ruled by Abbas, who's yeah. in his 80s. I don't even know what he does anymore. Uh, but what, like, what is the role that they're playing in acting still as the subcontractors for the occupation? And is there, you know, is there any movement for any kind of uh, change among among Palestinians in their leadership in the West Bank because it seems to me and correct me if I'm wrong but that the Palestinian Authority is a serious roadblock to any kind of uh, actual resistance. Yeah, there was a summit in Aqaba uh, with Abbas and the PA and many of their so-called partners who are basically the patrons keeping this Vichy regime alive in the West Bank. And it was really a means of pumping formaldehyde into the corpse of the PA. The PA is still active, however, and they have control of the security apparatus in the West Bank, which means that while Abbas constantly and his people constantly say they're suspending security collaboration with the Israeli army, they never fully do so because it would mean unleashing another intifada or chaos. However, their control of the security apparatus has never been weaker, and the control or influence of the traditional resistance factions, whether it's Fatah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or Hamas, over the minds of Palestinian youth in the West Bank has never been weaker. And that's why we've seen the rise of this element called the lion's den, which is essentially an informal grouping of young men who simply want to fight Israeli forces inside their own cities and prevent armed incursions. Uh, they represent no faction deliberately, and it's gained popularity all across any occupied area to the point where we're seeing more armed resistance against Israeli forces in the West Bank than at any time since the end of the Second Intifada, which effectively ended in the Balata refugee camp with a fight between the Palestinian Authority and the mm. last vestiges of Palestinian resistance factions. And now we're seeing again in Balata's in Nablus, we're seeing um, Palestinian resistance forces, particularly grouped in Nablus, fighting Israeli soldiers directly. They're taking lots of bodies. That's why you, when you hear about all of these Israeli raids, or we saw recently a death squad roll up in Janin in an unmarked car with masked men actually shoot people in the street. That's because the lion's den is frightening Israel's security chiefs so much. Their nightmare is that uh, armed resistance takes over the West Bank and overwhelms the Palestinian Authority. So the Palestinian Authority is kind of the last thing standing between that and just um, all against all. And, and, you know, and just as you're talking, I'm thinking, so what are Palestinians supposed to do? Right around right now, 
is the anniversary of the Great March of Return. It kicked off in late March of what, 2018, I think. And what was yeah. that? That was when tens of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza go out marching simply for the right to live uh, in freedom uh, against this Israeli blockade, against the Israeli government that stole all their land, which is why so many millions of Palestinians live in Gaza is because they and their families are refugees. And what happened to them? They were just gunned down by Israeli soldiers yeah. u- using U.S.-made weapons. And the whole world just shrugged. Yeah. Um, just, you know, uh, just shrugged. And so even when there's mass organized nonviolent resistance, Palestinians get gunned down and the world doesn't care. You know, so yeah, I mean, you- I remember Thomas Friedman would always write this column whenever anything would happen uh, in Palestine, like any resistance would take place. Armed resistance, he would say, why don't Palestinians just get together and walk towards the walls that they're confined in? And then liberals and the good people will meet them on the other side and say, hey, they're trying nonviolence and we will... Uh, let them in. And then we're all just going to like hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And then when they, they did it, they decided to do it. And they were all, I mean, and they've been doing it actually smaller events like this in Gaza for years. And then they were all just shot in the knees by snipers. I mean, this is kind of what it looked like when a teen was killed in 2019. Well, okay. Here, so here he ran to the wall with nothing. These are like, uh, not, these are, you know, I've passed through these walls. These are walls separate that just keep them in a literal open air prison. There are actually remote controlled machine guns on top of those walls, which allow a unit, which is dozens of kilometers away to shoot people by remote control when they walk up to the walls. But then there are snipers perched there and they would just shoot these guys cuz why they have to keep them out of Israel because they are not Jewish that's the only reason these are 80% of these people are the descendants of refugees who were forced from their lands and their homes in 1948 in order to form a Jewish state that would maintain a Jewish demographic majority and so basically Gaza is a warehouse a walled in warehouse for surplus humanity that can't come back to Israel because it will upset the demographic majority they need to maintain, which is the essence of racism. And so they're all, these are the youth being shot in the knees for trying to walk into the first world from their open air prison. So what are they supposed to do? You raise a great question. What are they supposed to do? Uh, They've called for BDS. They've called for nonviolent boycotts. Israel declares that anti-Semitism and wages war on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. It shoots protesters. I've seen protesters get shot in the West Bank for nonviolently protesting the walls being built through their farms. So what are they supposed to do? Well, we learn on Passover that the sword comes into the world when justice is delayed and justice is denied. And that's what is taking place right here when we see armed resistance against this occupation. I don't know if there's anything else to say, but what would Americans do? What would American farmers do? What would Republican red uh, armed men in the rural areas do if a foreign army came and took their lands? It would be like Red Dawn. That's kind of the plot of Red Dawn. And that's what Palestinians are living through and have been living through for decades and decades.